<clears throat> okay, so we have finally reached finance. I know everybody is so excited about it. It's always a fun part of the class. But here's the good news. It means you're getting close to the end. When we get to finance, it means you're getting close. I don't know if at this point is that good news or is that scary news or how do, how do we feel about that right now? Um, Finance, obviously, is one of the most important topics. You can tell by the weight of the slides that it's a pretty important topic. It's going to be really heavily tested, and most people don't like it a lot, <coughs> admittedly. Um, it can be a little bit dry, for sure. Now, I'll get you the slides in just a second. They're still printing. So turn to page uh, 393, <coughs> which is chapter 14. The principles of real estate finance. So this is sort of the introduction to finance. First of all, what do we mean when we say finance? What are we talking about? Loans. Loans. Mortgage loans, specifically, right? Remember, early in the class, we introduced this idea of a lien. What do we say a lien was? The right to do what? The right to foreclose because somebody owes you money and there's a chance that they may not do what? They may not pay you. So they have pledged something of value as collateral. What is that something of value? Home or property, right? Remember, we have to remind ourselves, we're not getting a real estate license to do residential real estate. You're getting a real estate license for everything, right? These these ideas don't just apply. And I know that's hard to do. I know we focus on house, 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 house. But they know you do that on a test. So you've got to be careful about that. Make sure when you apply something, the same rules apply for commercial finance as for residential finance. These are, it, there's no differentiation here. All right, are we okay with that? Everybody good so far? So, I'm not okay. There we go. So what is a mortgage? A mortgage is collateral. It is a pledge of security. Notice it doesn't say a mortgage is what? A loan. Because a mortgage is not a loan. A mortgage is a pledge of collateral. So let me ask you a question. Who owns the collateral? Is it the lender or is it the borrower? Who owns the collateral? The What's the collateral? The borrower. The, the borrower, because what is the collateral? Uh, the property, right? Yeah. Home, property. Whatever property we're talking about is the collateral. So, when we talk about who could pledge it as collateral, is that going to be the lender or is that going to be the borrower? That's going to be the borrower who can pledge this thing as collateral. We're going to break mortgage no loans down into two things, something called the, the mortgage itself, which is the promise of collateral, and then the promissory note. A promissory note is a contract. It's a contract between the lender and the borrower that the borrower will do what? We'll pay the money back. Notice that they are two separate things. We have the mortgage, which pledges the property as security. And then we also have a promissory note which says, I'm going to do what? Yeah. Pay the money back. They are two entirely separate things. You have to recognize that they're two separate things. This is not going to be one legal document. It's going to be how many? Two of them. One is an IOU. That's the promissory note. I owe you this much money. Did I mention anything about the property there? No. On this one, it says, I'm pledging my property as collateral. Did I mention anything about the loan? No. No, you notice there are two documents because they accomplish two separate things. One, the promissory note, recognizes that you owe the money. Everybody with me? What does the other one do? The mortgage. It places the property as collateral <coughs> for the loan. Does that make sense for everybody? So let me ask you a question. If I told you that only one of these two documents was recorded at the county courthouse, which one do you think it would be? Would it be the mortgage or would it be the promissory note? Jen says mortgage. What do we record 
What do we record at the county courthouse in real estate transactions? Indeed. Documents that affect what? Title or just affect the real estate. Think about the purpose of recording. What's the purpose of recording? So that the public knows that there's something impacting what? The property. The property. Which one of these impacts the property? The property. Is it the promissory note or is it the mortgage? The promissory note. The mortgage. Wait, wait, wait. The promissory note wouldn't impact the property? What does it say anything on an IOU about a property? I owe you $150,000. What's that got to do with property? Okay. That's what I mean about you got to get this separation in your brain. This thing has nothing to do with real estate. I owe the bank money. They didn't even mention the property. I pledge my property as collateral. Didn't mention the what? The money. They are two separate things. They accomplish two. So which one is going to be recorded? The mortgage. The mortgage is going to be recorded because that's the one that impacts the property. That's the one that impacts the property. Your promissory note is between you and the bank. It is nobody else's business. Why would your mortgage be somebody else's business? In the event they want to buy it. It represents a what? What's that L word? Oh. A lien against the property. And liens are what? We haven't mentioned this word in a long time. Let's see if you remember it. A liens are a pertinent, which means they do what? They come with the property. They transfer with title. Would that be important to somebody who's buying that property? Yes. So is it important that this thing get recorded in the county courthouse so that a potential buyer knows that there is this problem? with it? Because a lien is a problem. Do you agree with that? If you're buying the property, a lien is a big problem. Do you want to buy the property and have somebody else's mortgage attached to it? No. So that's why we record them. That's the purpose of recording that document. How we feel? Because I'm telling you, if you lie to me and say, oh, I'm good, you will be so lost that you'll never be found, be buried under this floor within the next 15 minutes. You have got to build this in your mind in little tiny <coughs> building blocks. And you better be willing to speak up and say, I have no idea what the crap you just said. Because if I think you're okay and I move on, we'll be on topics that build on this and you've got no foundation for it. Okay? So when I ask him, I'm not just asking for my own help. I'm saying, are you good? Do you understand the difference between a mortgage and a promissory note? A promissory note is the money aspect. Everybody hear the question? She said, the, it, does the promissory note the money aspect? What's the answer to that? Yes. 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 Then the mortgage is just the fact. Right. Okay, so, yeah. so, okay. So, promissory note. I owe the bank money. Mortgage. If I don't pay the bank, they can do what? Take my property. Notice the promissory note doesn't mention anything about the property. And the mortgage doesn't mention anything about the, the loan. They accomplish two separate goals. Alright? That, and that's why they're two separate documents. So, we need to talk about the theories of mortgage. The theories of mortgaging property. Lynn, you want to give me a favor and go around there and ask Elizabeth if I said, Brennan, you know what her office is? <coughs> back right corner. All the way to the back right corner. Before just grab the stuff off the printer, one of the two. Because your slides are there. So, we need to talk about the two legal theories of mortgaging property. There are two ways. A theory is just a way to accomplish this thing. We have two ways to get this accomplished. And we don't get to choose which one. In fact, we don't get to choose, the lender doesn't get to choose which one. This is set based on which state you are in. Some states use what we call the lien theory of mortgaging. And this whole idea is called hypothecation, by the way. That's a, that's a really fancy sounding word. Hypothecation. Hypothecation just means pledging property as collateral for a loan. So that's really mortgaging, isn't it? It means the same thing. Hypothecation, pledging the property as collateral. It, it is the same exact thing. So different states use different ways to accomplish this process. 
Some states use what we call lean theory, and some states use what we call title theory. Let's talk about lean theory. Lean theory is the most old-fashioned approach to mortgage lending. It's by far the more traditional approach of the two. There are only going to be two parties involved with a lien theory mortgage. What, part, what two parties do you think they are? This is not, should not be a tough question. If you're even remotely awake and thinking about lending, what two parties would naturally be involved in a mortgage loan? Two. Lender and borrower. Guess what? In a lien theory mortgage, this is why this is the traditional approach, those are the only two parties that are going to be involved in this thing. The lender and the borrower. It says here that the borrower retains both legal and equitable title to the property. What that means is that the borrower is fully in control. Notice, we always use a stupid expression. I say it's stupid because it drives me crazy in this class because we use it, ah ha ha ha, it's so funny, but it's so wrong. How many of you have ever heard the joke, you know, when somebody says, well, do you own your own house? And somebody says, well, I don't, but the bank does. How many of you have ever heard somebody make that joke? It's the dumbest thing in the world. The bank doesn't own your house. You know why I know that? Because if they did, they'd live there. Who owns your house? You do. Just because you've pledged it as collateral doesn't mean it all of a sudden belongs to them. Does that make sense for you guys? I mean, and the funny thing is, we don't talk about it with anything else like that. How many of you said that your car belongs to the bank? You say what? My car. Yeah, I'm making payments on it. Has the car been pledged as collateral for that loan? Yes. How do you know that? Because if you stop paying, what do they do? They come and get, they come and get the car so that they can sell it and get their money back. Does that make sense to everybody? That's how you know the car is collateral for the loan. Well, do we do the same thing with houses? Don't make this harder than it is. It's your house. But you've told them they have the right to do what if you default on that loan? Take to take it from you. So the borrower has all the power here. The borrower in a lien theory state has title to the property. What that means is that if the lender needs to foreclose, there's only one place they can do it. Where do you go to take something from someone? Court. In a lien theory state, foreclosure happens through a judicial process, meaning that the lender has to go sue the borrower. And what two documents do you think the lender's going to bring to court with them? The promissory note and the mortgage. They're going to say, here's a promissory note where Jen promised to pay us $200,000. Here's proof that she has not paid us the $200,000 because she hasn't sent us a mortgage payment in six months. And here is another document that says, if she doesn't pay, we have the right to do what? To take her property. So we are asking you, Your Honor, to give us title to her property. Does that make sense for everybody? To take title away from her. But I can't do that as the lender. Who do I have to ask to do it for me? A judge court of law. It's a judicial foreclosure process. Let me ask you a question. How fast is court? Not very slow. slow. This is not how we process foreclosures in the state of North Carolina. We don't use lien theory in the state of North Carolina. We're a title theory state. We're going to talk about what title theory is in a second. Why do you think lenders don't like this process? What about this process would a lender not like? It takes too long. Too slow. If they need to do what? If they need to foreclose. Does the lender have a choice about that? No. No, because if you're lending in a state that uses lien theory, guess what you got to follow? Lien theory. Does that make sense for everybody? Yeah. So let's talk about the other method. Or actually, let me give you some terminology first, and then we'll talk about the other method. We haven't introduced this terminology yet. Mortgage or <coughs> and mortgagee. Now, what do we say the mortgage was? It's the collateral, right? Remember, the promissory note is the loan. But the mortgage is the what? It's the collateral. Who owns the collateral? The borrower. The OR person is the giver, right? Whatever word we put in front of it, the OR is the giver. Does that make sense? So, 
if the mortgage is the collateral, who has the collateral to give? The lender. The owner of the property. They have the collateral, correct? Right. So who's the mortgage or? Owner of property. The owner of the property. And when you put it in lending terms, is that the lender or is that the borrower? The borrower. That is the borrower. borrower. The mortgage or is the borrower. That is one that will throw you for a loop every time because what have you been trained to think of a mortgage as? If I'd asked you before you walked in this room today, what's a mortgage? What was the first word that would come out of your mouth? Well, a loan. And so you think, well, who gives the loan? That must be the lender. Wrong. Because a mortgage is not a loan. Mortgage is collateral. So therefore, the mortgage or is not the lender, but the borrower, which makes the mortgagee this guy. The banker. The mortgagee is the lender because they're receiving that promise of collateral. How we feel about that terminology? Okay. Be careful. That's one that's like selling firm. You have to really drill that into your head, right? The selling firm is on whose side of the transaction? Money. The buyer side. It's, it, remember, the first time I said that, you're like, ugh, I'll never remember that. Well, if you do it enough, you remember it. So is mortgage or going to be one of those things you have to practice, right? Mortgage or is not is the borrower. Mortgage E is the lender, okay? You said the lender is receiving the what? What is the lender receiving? You tell me. Well, what is a mortgage? A mortgage is a, prom a promise to pay. Not a promise to pay. A promise of what? Help around. Collateral. Collateral. What's the collateral? The mortgage. No, it is a, but what is the collateral? The, the, property. the property. The property is the collateral, right? Mm -hmm. So a mortgage is a promise of collateral. Who owns the collateral? The buyer. Well, the, um, buyer slash borrower, yeah. right? Because we're talking about finance, they're now the borrower, right? Mm -hmm. So who can give collateral? The borrower. So who's the mortgagor? The, oh. There you go. Okay. So mortgage is just a promise of collateral given by the borrower to the lender. Okay. Okay? Talk about title theory. This is how we accomplish financing in North Carolina, and not just on homes. Remember, this applies to any mortgage loan <coughs> made in the state of North Carolina. We are a title theory state. Why do you have to know lien theory? Because you're taking a national exam, right? You're taking a national exam, you're taking a state-specific exam, so you've got to know both. you got to know the differences between the two. I'm going to give you a hint. The big difference is the foreclosure process. That's what changes between a lien theory state and a title theory state. What did we say was not very nice for the lender in a lien theory state? The judicial process. Having to go to court. That judicial process is very what? Time consuming and slow. So what do you think we're going to avoid in the title theory process? Court. We're going to avoid court. Title theory is designed to avoid lawsuits for foreclosure. When you sue for foreclosure, you're in a lien theory state. You don't sue for foreclosure in North Carolina. You don't have to. Because we have introduced a third party into the mortgage process. In North Carolina. In a lien theory state, we said there were two parties involved. What two parties were they? The borrower and the lender. Well, the only way to settle a dispute when you have two parties to any contract is for one of them to do what? Sue the other. In North Carolina, we like to use basketball references, so we have a referee. We decide up front if there's a dispute, we want you, Breon, to referee that dispute. And we call that referee a trustee. We call that referee a trustee. So who are the three parties going to be in North Carolina? Borrower, lender, trustee. What's the trustee's job? Referee any disputes. And so what power do you think we give the trustee? What's the only thing that could possibly be in dispute here? Foreclosure. So what power do we give the trustee? The power to foreclose. We call it a power of sale foreclosure process. So rather than the lender having to sue the borrower for foreclosure, what does the lender do? <coughs> Pick up the phone and call the trustee and say they haven't paid me. You want to hear a dirty little secret? 
You know who the trustee is going to be? The lender's attorney. Very uh, unbiased referee there, huh? <laughs> So which, which foreclosure process is easier from a lender's perspective? I have to sue you for foreclosure in a court of law, or I call my own attorney and say, foreclose. Which one's easier to accomplish if you're the lender? Which state do lenders prefer? <coughs> Title theory states like North Carolina. Which foreclosure process is going to happen more quickly? Judicial foreclosure or power of sale foreclosure? Power of sale. And people say, well, why does the trustee have that power? Because who gave it to them? The borrower and the lender at the very beginning of the process. And somebody said, well, I don't want to do that. But then you don't want to borrow money. Because this is the only way it's accomplished in North Carolina. If you don't want to have the power of sale foreclosure process, you need to move to another state. Because this is the way mortgage lending is accomplished in this state. Does that make sense for everybody? Again, you don't have an option. It's set in stone. If you borrow money with a mortgage note in this state, you're going to have title theory. That means you're going to have this power of sale foreclosure, which means there's going to be a trustee. And that means it's going to be on the express path to foreclosure. Now, just because lenders can foreclose quickly, does that mean they have to? No. Because uh, I've had that. People say, well, I, you know, I had a neighbor and he didn't make a mortgage payment for a year and Bank of America didn't foreclose. Bank of America doesn't have to foreclose. We're not saying foreclosure will always be quick. Be quick. We are saying that when the lender decides they want to foreclose from that moment forward, title theory is much more rapid than lien theory. Does everybody follow me on that? Not only is it more rapid, it's cheaper. Which is more expensive, having to go to court and sue somebody for foreclosure or pick up the phone and call? Which, which costs more money? So not only is it slower, it's more expensive. Are we understanding the differences here between the two? So when we look at a title theory state, again, we've now got three parties involved, and a trustee has one job. Decide who to turn title over to. The trustee's either going to do one of two things. They're either going to turn title back over to the borrower, if the borrower does what? Pays off the note. If they satisfy the note, that's the language you use, if the note gets satisfied, then the trustee's going to turn title back over to the borrower. If the note is defaulted on, the trustee's going to foreclose on the property. And what is a foreclosure? Taking the property and doing what? Sell. Selling it. It's the trustee's job to sell the property. It's not actually the bank's job. The trustee doesn't say, I hear Bank of America, you take the property. The trustee is actually going to be the one to sell the property. They're going to be the one to place it for sale. Where do you think they place it for sale? Courthouse. At the county courthouse. That's exactly right. It's called a trustee's sale. Okay? So the deed of trust, we don't use mortgages in North Carolina. What did we say the mortgage was in a lien theory state? Collateral. It's the collateral. We still need collateral. We still need a document that gives the property as collateral. But in North Carolina, we don't call it a mortgage. We call it a what? Deed of trust. Deed of trust. Because who has been placed in trust of it? A trustee. What does a deed do, first of all? Transfers title. Who are we transferring title to? The trustee. So who's holding that title in the balance? The trustee is. They have the power. That's what we call it, power of sale. They have the right to place that property for sale if they believe that the borrower's in default. It's all up to the trustee. So when the lender declares the borrower in default, they're going to send notice to two people. They're going to send the borrower notice, and they're going to send notice to trustee. trustee. And the trustee's going to send notice to the borrower that I am moving forward with what? Foreclosure. foreclosure. I've been notified you're in default. I'm moving forward with foreclosure. <laughs> I'm placing your property for sale. The deed of trust must be recorded at the county courthouse to be enforced. What law governs documents that must be recorded? The Conner Act. What law governs documents that must be in writing? The statute of frauds, right? Okay. So a deed of trust 
Would it be covered by one or the other or both? Both. Both. Because anything covered by the Conner Act is automatically covered by the statute of frauds. Because you can't record it unless it's first what? In writing. In writing. Does that make sense for everybody? Okay, good. All right. We talked about the three foreclosure methods, judicial, or we talked about two of them, judicial and non-judicial. I'm just not even going to spend time on strict foreclosure because nobody practices it. Here's what a strict foreclosure is. A strict foreclosure would be the bank actually taking ownership of the property. That's not what we do. Whether we're in a lien theory state or a title theory state, what do we always do when we foreclose on the property? Sell it. A strict foreclosure would actually be where the lender could take ownership of the property. And that's not what we do. We sell the property. Because what does the lender ultimately deserve? Not the property, but the what? Money. The money. And the only way to get the money is to sell it. property, there's going to be some proceeds, correct? We need to know what order to pay. Why is the order important? Remember when we talked about lien priority way back in chapter 3? Why did we say the order was important? We may run out of money. We may run out of money. And lien priority is still here. Remind me about lien priority. What lien gets paid first? Taxes. Property taxes and don't forget the other one that sits there with property taxes. Special assessments. What's a special assessment? I feel like that one gets lost in the shuffle for people. What's a special assessment? Well, sidewalks and street lights are examples, but talk to me about what has actually happened. Government or homeowners associations, property owners associations do improvements on your property. So what's an improvement? Anything that's been constructed that would add value, right? So some entity, the government, property owners association has improved your property, whether you wanted it or not, and it's added value to your property, at least in their vision, and they do what with that, with the bill for that thing? They send it to you, and it becomes a lien against your property. And it sit, and it's, a, it's an important lien because where does it sit? At the very top, it sits right up there with the property taxes, right? So, we still have lien priority. Property taxes and special assessments are still the first liens that are going to get paid. And then what's the second liens that are going to get paid? Mortgages in the order that they're recorded. You ever heard of a first mortgage or a second mortgage? That just refers to the order in which they're going to get paid. And then what do we get to? Things like mechanics liens, finally. Well... In a foreclosure, the order gets shuffled slightly. We don't put things out of order, we just put something at the very beginning. What gets put in front of the property taxes and special assessments in this case? Cost of the sale. In North Carolina, when that trustee, who do we say was going to process the foreclosure? Who's going to actually sell the property? The trustee. And who do we say the trustee was? The attorney who was chosen specially by the lender, right? Do attorneys work for free? No. If they have to process this foreclosure and place this property for sale at the county courthouse and to manage that sale, is that process going to be free? No. Matter of fact, is sending out that notice of default to the borrower going to be a free service? No. no. Well, who are they going to bill? The They're not going to bill the lender. They're not going to bill the borrower. It's coming out <coughs> off the top. It's coming out off the top. So here's the thing. You need to understand that once we go through the foreclosure process, is the amount that's actually going to be owed against that property going to be what the original loan amount was, or is it going to have ballooned substantially? Oh, it's going to be a lot higher because all those fees that that trustee has tacked on are coming out first before we even start paying the mortgage. And not only are those fees going to be attached, but is the lender going to have attached their own fees for being late and being in default? and deferred interest that wasn't paid, and penalties. So, 
could we easily see a hundred and fifty thousand dollar mortgage note that results in a two hundred thousand dollar foreclosure? Yes. You better believe it. Which is why foreclosure should be avoided at all costs if you're the if you're the borrower. I, I have seen people in the past who got behind on their mortgage and never considered the fact that they could sell the property. They sit there and they get caught up in this idea, it's my house, it's my house, I don't want to lose my house. Well, guess what? If you can't pay your mortgage, you're going to lose your house. The question is, do you lose it on your own terms or do you lose it on their terms? Which is better? Your own terms, i.e. put it up for what? For sale. Because even if you have some small amount of equity, is that better than being foreclosed on and getting absolutely nothing and having your credit ruined in the process? And maybe a judgment after the fact. We're going to talk about those too. Okay? Remember, foreclosure is a terrible outcome. So let me ask this. Okay. The paying of uh, all costs of the sale, does that include the real estate? Wonderful question. I like the way he thinks. Yes, it does. If a real estate broker was used in the foreclosure sale. Now, real estate brokers usually are not used in the foreclosure sale. Because where does a foreclosure sale usually happen? At the county courthouse. So it would mostly just be the courthouse fees. And by the way, let's talk about that foreclosure at the county courthouse. Actually, let me put this back up because it helps to look at that while you're talk, thinking about this. If this is the order that things are paid in, one of the things you need to understand about that is that whoever's doing the foreclosure only cares about themselves. But part of caring about myself is I have to also care about the people who are where in line in relation to me ahead of me in line. Do I care about the people behind me in line? No. So if I'm the lender, the mortgage lender, where am I sitting in this line? Right in the middle. So I have to make sure that this property sells for enough to pay who? The people behind you. I mean in front of me. People in front of me and me. Do I care about people back here? No. No. Go one step backwards. What if it's the county foreclosing for property taxes? Who do they care about? Themselves and the person in front of them, the cost of the sale. Do they care about the mortgages? No. No. So, would it be really dumb of Bank of America to allow the county to foreclose for unpaid taxes? Yes. yes. Yes, because the county only cares about selling it for enough to satisfy what? Their lien and the cost of the sale. Do they care about Bank of America's $200,000 mortgage? No. no. What's going to happen to Bank of America's $200,000 mortgage? Gone with the wind. So, if the taxes are unpaid, who better get off the rear end and pay them? Bank. The lender. The lender. Because the last thing you ever want is somebody ahead of you in line to foreclose. Because if they're ahead of you in line, guess who's not getting paid? You are not. Because they have no reason. If the taxes are $5,000 and the cost of the sale are another $3,000, how much is the county going to process that foreclosure sale for? $8,000. They care about Bank of America's $200,000 mortgage sitting back there? No. Nope. Don't care. So if you're Bank of America, <laughs> you better pay the taxes. You follow me on that? Whether you want to or not, you better pay them. Now, what are you going to do as soon as you have to pay the taxes? You're going to foreclose. But now when you foreclose, you're going to dictate a price that will not only cover the cost of the sale and the taxes, but will cover also what? Your mortgage. Now, people say, well, how can they dictate? They can't force what it sells at auction. Sure they can. How can Bank of America dictate what it sells for at auction? They can bid. They can bid. So a lot of times what actually happens, folks, and you have to understand how it got to that point. Do we see on the market houses that are foreclosed and currently owned by Bank of America or Wells Fargo or SunTrust? Do we see those houses out there? Sure we do. How did they come into ownership of that property? They bought it at the foreclosure auction. They were the high bidder at the foreclosure auction. And most of the time, they're the high bidder 
even though they're the ones who started the foreclosure in the first place. If Bank of America is owed $200,000 and there's another $5,000 in property taxes and there's $10,000 in costs of the sale, that's a total of what? Two fifteen, dollars right? Guess who the first bidder is going to be? Bank of America. Bank of America. For how much? Two fifteen. dollars Absolutely, they're going to bid first. Because if they don't, they run the risk of that property selling for much less than that note amount. And who would take that, that hit instantly? The Bank of America would. So they would rather bid two fifteen dollars themselves and at least have a chance to market the property with the use of a real estate broker and the MLS because they feel like that's going to be the best route to get them the best possible payback on that note. Does that make sense for everybody? And why are they willing to bid 215? Where's the 215 going right back? To themselves. They're paying money to themselves because the court is going to disperse the money in court. So if Bank of America goes to that auction, and they bid 215. How much of that 215 are they going to get? They're going to get 200 because the 10,000 is going to go to pay the cost of the sale, and the 5,000 is going to pay the property taxes, and then the 200 that's left over is going to go right back to them. So essentially, how much should they have to pay to get the property? $15,000. <clears> but now they actually own the property, and they can sell it in any manner they see fit. Can they hire a real estate broker? Yes. Could they go in and fix it up if they wanted to, if they thought that would get a better return? Yes. Absolutely. Because it's now their property. Because they bought it at the foreclosure auction. So I don't want you to think of foreclosure as Bank of America taking the property. The only way Bank of America can end up with the property is if they buy it just like anybody else. And why would they be the first bid? Because they hope that somebody will do what? Bid higher. Is Bank of America going to have a party if somebody bids 220? Yes. Sure. Because if somebody bids 220, that's going to be enough to pay the cost of the sale, pay the taxes, and pay Bank of America. They're thrilled if somebody outbids them. Thrilled. Because all they want is their money back anyway. Yes, ma'am. Is it why the foreclosure is not necessarily cheaper? Because before I saw the foreclosure houses should be a lot cheaper than normal market value. Why would they? Just like I saw, it's like same as short sale, so it's like cheaper than the market value. Short so sales aren't cheaper than market value. Because you you watch like TV, like HGTV. Oh, oh, there it is! Oh, there it is! Oh, you gotta get it for we watched HGTV. <laughs> so let's talk about how real HGTV is. <laughs> What's your know. favorite show on HGTV? I like it. Um, fix up. You like yeah. fixer up? Okay. All right. You ever seen House Hunters? Yeah, I saw that. I just got a cast. I just got a casting call for House Hunters last week. I did. They sent me an email. They, they, they wanted to know if I wanted to be on House Hunters. And here's what the casting call says: We want to know if you have a young family with two children between these two ages who've already purchased a home in the last six months in this neighborhood in this price range. Now, what show do they want to be on? House Hunters. House Hunters. But they want a family who's already done what? Yeah. Purchased a home. Oh, my gosh, it couldn't be scripted like that. Could it possibly <laughs> that that family you're looking at is already owns that house that you're watching them look at and go, oh we want to make an offer on this one. By the way, they already bought it three months ago. Wow. Wow. So now we want, to, we want to base what we're doing in this class on HGTV. It's all fake. The truth is, the term market value means whatever buyers are willing to pay. So there's no such thing for a property that sells below market value. Because the foreclosure process is going to establish what? The market value. The only reason we think of foreclosures as being cheaper is because in most cases they're in terrible condition. Yeah. But they sell for market value because whatever buyers are willing to pay for that property in that condition at that point in time is its market value. And when you ask your question, I know what you're getting at, but I have to make it clear that that's the market value. The reason 
that people might expect that they would be cheaper is because they're generally in bad condition. Well, why might they not be in our market necessarily that big of a value? Give me some factors that foreclosures in our market might not be that seen as that big of a value. Demand. Demand. What does our market look like right now? A buyer's market? I mean, sorry, seller's, seller's market. market. Yeah, Crazy absolutely. seller's market, yeah, right? Yeah. Crazy competition. More competition is going to lead prices to do what? Price. Go up. Whether we're talking about foreclosures or whether we're talking about regular sales, prices right now are ridiculously high because there's tremendous demand. Tremendous demand. There are no bargains out there right now. Not in this market. Would there be bargains in other markets where there are more foreclosures than there is demand for them? Yeah. Matter of fact, are there very many foreclosures at all in our market right now? Because yeah. generally speaking, most people that get foreclosed on are upside down, correct? Mm -hmm. Meaning they owe more than the property's worth. You've got to work pretty hard right now to be upside down in this market. Because even if you just bought two years ago, you've probably seen 10% appreciation in your property. So you can probably sell yeah. and get out of it. Does that make sense? Yeah. So it's all driven by demand. Another question. You said that foreclosure happened at county courthouse. Mm -hmm. But I saw foreclosure property before that is listed by a real estate agent. Exactly right. And that means that bank already took over? It means the bank bought it at the courthouse. It means oh. the bank was the buyer at the courthouse. Okay, so if the courthouse were put out for sale, it wouldn't have a for real estate agent, right? Correct. No broker involved. But, and then you say this state is a trustee state, like mm -hmm. you have three parties. Mm -hmm. Who has the title? The trustee. But then it's a title title to your the borrower's name? Sorry? It's a title titles to the whose name? I mean... The owner of the property. <coughs> All right. And, and then the buyer then, immediately signs that title over to who? The trustee. The trustee. So the buyer don't have the title? Not, they, they do not have legal title to that property. Who does? The trustee. The trustee. Um. Until the mortgage is satisfied. That's exactly right. So that equals the trustee. Okay. The trustee has legal title, but not equitable title. They're two separate things. Equitable title is the right to be in the property. Who still has that? The buyer. The buyer, owner, borrower, all same person, right? They have equitable title, but legal title, who has it? The trustee does. The trustee has the right to do what with that property? To sell it if that borrower defaults on that note. That's title theory state. It's how it operates. Okay? Go ahead, Mark. So, let's say the, the bank messed up and didn't pay the taxes. Then the, the, the property tax is mm -hmm. foreclosed. Okay. Can they still go back in and like bid? Buy the foreclosure? Sure they can. At the, uh, higher price? Sure they can. Price? Absolutely. So Lynn's question is, suppose the bank messes up and doesn't pay the property taxes and the county forecloses on it. Can the lender bid at that auction? Sure they can. Everybody can, right? And we would hope that if they forgot to pay the taxes, they would at least catch the foreclosure auction. But if they missed one, they might miss both. Somebody's going to get fired at Bank of America if that happens. Everybody good with that, this idea? Okay. So when you see a property being marketed by a bank, how do they come, in, how do they come into ownership with it? They bought it at the foreclosure auction. And most often that's going to be the lender who had the note on the property. Most often. Okay? Now notice at the end, if there's any money left over, where does it go? Ha 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 Never gets there. It never gets there, but where would it go? Back to the borrower. But remember, nobody's got any incentive to drive this number up to that point, right? Nobody has any incentive to drive that number up to that point. And if you think about all the fees that are going to be tacked on as a result of a foreclosure, what are the what are the odds of there being any surplus left over? What are the odds are? Who sits in this box right here, by the way? Mechanics liens. So if they foreclose, who do they have to pay? 
All these people in front of them in line, which is why you very rarely see a mechanics lien actually foreclosed on. HOAs sit back here. HOAs can foreclose, but they sit back here in line. So all these other ones get paid first. Yes, sir, Nick. So if so the house gets foreclosed on and they can't sell the house for how much they want to recoup the, the mortgage debt. What happens? Who is, who is they? Uh, like Bank of America. Okay. So they, they get the property and they just can't so, sell it. So they bought it at the foreclosure yeah, auction. Yeah, they buy it at the foreclosure auction. Yep. And they just can't sell it. So if does like the mortgage debt just disappear after that, they sell the property for less? The mortgage is gone as soon as it goes through foreclosure. Okay. The foreclosure process strips every lien away from that okay. property. Okay, okay. So as soon as Bank of America buys it at the foreclosure auction, so they say, no longer have a lien okay. on the property. They're just simply the owner. Okay. So at that point in time, their goal is to sell it for what they've got invested in it. Because what do they have invested in it? They've got the amount they, lent, they loaned out to somebody right. originally, right. right? Plus whatever else they had to pay at the foreclosure auction. That's what they have invested. So that's their goal, to try to sell it for that amount. Are they likely to be able to sell it for that amount? Maybe. Pro maybe, but probably not. <clears throat> They're probably going to take a loss. Because if they weren't going to take a loss, it wouldn't have gotten to this point anyway. It's very rare for the bank not to take a loss once we get to a foreclosure action. Yes? So um, according to what you said, um, the answer you gave him, you said the bank has no, they don't worry about the guys behind them. Correct. So the mechanics liens that might be there, for instance, they don't have enough money to pay off the mechanics lien. Do those liens still stay with the property? It's all the foreclosure the erases every single one of these liens. That foreclosure auction sale, liens are wiped away. The property is starting fresh. So is one of the main reasons they don't recoup the money a lot of times because like they sell the property and it's in good condition and then the, the borrower like destroys the property and then the home gets foreclosed on and then they just lose a bunch of money in this whole process? Alright, so back up because I want to make sure you know where the foreclosure happened in that process because it sounded like to me you thought the foreclosure happened in the beginning. Okay? So the property is sold to a buyer. Right. Takes ownership of the property. Mm -hmm. They borrowed $200,000. Yep. Okay? They default on their mortgage mm -hmm. at some point yep. along the way. The bank comes in and forecloses, which means the property gets sold at a foreclosure sale, correct? Yeah. Remember, the cost of the foreclosure sale could be tremendous. That trustee may have $20,000 in fees as a result of the foreclosure action, okay? okay. And those are gonna get paid first so let's say Bank of America comes in and buys it at the foreclosure auction. They can't buy it for the $200,000 they loaned out. They've got to buy it for at least enough to satisfy the cost of the sale, any outstanding property taxes, plus their note. So let's say they have to pay two twenty-five dollars at the foreclosure auction. Does that make sense? Mm -hmm. Now, they've got two twenty-five dollars invested in this thing. Now they have to market it. Well, let's say they can sell it for two twenty-five. That's still not getting them out of it because who did they hire to sell it now? Real estate. Real estate broker. And they're probably paying a six percent, five percent commission on that two twenty-five. So they're paying another twelve, thirteen thousand dollars in real estate commissions. So they still have a loss, even if they can sell it for. So they they only loaned out two hundred. They eventually took it, foreclosed on it, sold it for two twenty-five, and they still lost twelve thousand dollars. Money can get eaten up in a hurry through this process. It is a costly process. That help with the question? Yeah, that makes sense. That's how they end up with a loss still. It might look at first glance like they're not taking a loss, but they probably are just because of the cost, the tremendous cost involved. And then you get into the fact that the borrowers are they usually very happy on the way out the door in a foreclosure. <coughs> what do they do? Destroy. They destroy it. So now we can't sell it for two twenty five, we don't sell it for one seventy five. Do we have a big loss now? Yeah. That's how they end up with losses on this. How about the consequences for a borrower? You... She always loves to ask about consequences. Like, she thinks we're just going to throw everybody in like some gulag somewhere and like make them do hard labor for the rest of it. What are the consequences? Well, their credit's ruined, but it was already ruined because they weren't doing what? They weren't making payments. Yeah, that's the only thing. That's it. We're going to talk about what might else happen. 
And the second is called a deficiency judgment. But again, deficiency judgment is only as good as the paper it's written on. But you think it's really a property because they piss off this stuff. <laughs> what do you want to do to them? I keep asking you that question, right? What do you think is going to happen? No, it's not going to jail over it. Sorry, doesn't happen. The jails are already full. So, here's the thing. And this but it brings up a wonderful question. And these are why we need to ask these questions. We need to have this conversation. What would a prudent bank do? to prevent putting themselves in that position. Put it in their agreement. Um, put what in their agreement? Like say a clause or something saying that they did destroy the property if they go into foreclosure, maybe. What are, if what? There's got to be a then. If then what? <laughs> they don't have to pay. pay for the they do have to pay. Yes, good luck. They agreed to pay in the first place. Right. We got the foreclosure because they agreed to pay and they didn't pay. So, blah, that ain't helping. It'd be best for the bank pages yeah. to leave yeah. to offer a team to lose or something like that. Maybe Back up further that. than that. How do you prevent yourself from taking this loss in the first place? Qualify the buyer. Qualify the buyer. Only lend to people who are very trustworthy. That's one thing. Still a big one hanging out there. How do I limit my losses? Make sure that I don't lend so much that if I have to foreclose, I can't what? Recoup my money. Make sure that I only lend a limited amount of money so that if I have to foreclose, in other words, if I think worst case scenario, fire tears this thing to shit <laughs> and I had to foreclose on it and sell it. I can only get 175 out of it. Maybe what I should be lending is what? 175. Now you're starting to think like a banker. Don't think about who's going to protect you after the fact. Protect yourself. That's where we get in the idea of loan to value ratios and what numbers are comfortable for lenders. We'll talk a lot about an 80% loan-to-value loan. That means the lender is lending 80% of the value of the property. Why do you think 80% would be a very comfortable number for a lender? Because they're thinking if worst case scenario happens and I have to foreclose, I can probably sell it for what? At least 80% of what it's worth currently and get my money back and move on with my life. Does that make sense for everybody? That provides a big cushion for the lender. So traditionally, if you wanted to borrow money to purchase a home, you had to have at least how much money to put down? 20%. Why did they require you to put 20% down? Because that was not that was their trust buffer. They wanted to make sure that if they had to foreclose, they could get, in other words, if I walk into, let's think of this thing in something else. Let's put it in some other terms. Pawn shop. If I walk into a pawn shop and I have something of value, and I say to the pawn shop owner, I want to borrow money. Isn't that what a pawn shop's for? Is that what you do in a pawn shop? You borrow money, right? And you give them what? Collateral. Collateral. They look at the collateral and they come up with a value of it. Do they lend you that amount of money? No, they lend you what? Less. Less. Why? Because if you don't pay off that loan, they need to be able to do what? Sell it and get what? Their money back. They're at least no their money back. But at least their money back. Correct? Does that make sense? Plus whatever fees they're charging and all that, they need to get all of that back. Making a loan on a house or a property is no different, folks. The lender needs to look at the value of the thing they're lending on. When you ask, how do you prevent that? Well, don't be a dumbass as a lender. Don't lend people so much money. Well, guess what? Every lender in this country is a dumbass. Why did we have a mortgage meltdown? The simple answer is this. Because we didn't make borrowers do what? We made them qualify, but we didn't make them do what? Bring a down payment. There would have never been a mortgage meltdown if every borrower had to put 20% down. 
But the ugly truth is, would we have a mortgage? Would we? Ha would the housing market look dramatically different if we made every borrower put 20% down? So what, bar what lenders have traded is profit for security. It's more profitable to make more mortgages, correct? And it's easier to make more mortgages if you don't make people do what? Bring as much of a down payment. So what they've done is they've traded profit for security because the borrowers simply don't have as much collateral in the game anymore. When you're lending 90%, 95%, 96.5%, 100% loan to value, 105% loan to value. Oh yeah, that's happened. What kind of security does a lender really have when they're lending more than the property is actually worth? Very little, right? Go ahead, ma'am. Uh, oh, she, sorry, Jen. Uh, I was wondering, is this why uh, we're in a broker price and we want to come into the picture and just determine all of the value ratio? So a broker price opinion usually comes into the picture when a lender's considering foreclosing. When a lender's looking at a borrower who's in default, and they're trying to decide what to do, one of the big guiding factors of what the lender does is going to be how much the property is worth at that point in time. So they need an idea of what the property is worth at that point in time. So they might reach out to a real estate broker and say, what is this property worth? That's where a broker price opinion might come in. Go ahead. Um, I guess, like, do you think we're, we will have, like, another, like, mortgage? Absolutely, because unequivocally, I don't, without I don't question. Think banks are still doing that. They're still not qualifying buyers. I yes, they are every single day. You know what kind of credit score you need to get 100% financing right now? 620. 620%. 600% financing. So you ask me, are we going to have a mortgage meltdown? You know what the answer is? Absolutely. The magic is predicting when. And why will we have a mortgage meltdown? Because banks are greedy. And they always have been. And you know what we did the last time we had a mortgage meltdown? We bailed them out let them get away with it. You know who the CEO of Citibank is today? His name is Jamie Dimon. You know who the CEO of Citibank was when they lost $120 billion in mortgages? Jamie Dimon. Jamie Dimon. What? You want penalties? Look at those folks. What penalty did they pay? Nothing. So you want to chase these borrowers around? Go chase them. Go chase the CEO of Citibank. Go chase the CEO of Bank of America. Go chase the CEO of Wells Fargo. Go chase the CEO of Wachovia. Oh wait, where are they? They're Wells Fargo. And how did Wells Fargo have the money to buy out another bank? Because they took bailout money and bought another bank with it. By the way, you know who the chairman of the U.S. Treasury is right now? No. <laughs> no. His best friend. A former CEO of a major investment bank that lost billions in the mortgage meltdown. These people will absolutely create another one for them. Because you know why? They made billions in the last one. They didn't lose anything. They made money. It worked wonderfully for them. And all the rest of us that it screwed. So when you ask, is it coming again? Yes. Sure it is. Because we didn't learn anything from the last time. It happens every so often. It happens every so often. Because there's no money in saying no. When you take somebody into a lender and you see if they qualify for a loan, how much money is there to be made for the lender, for the real estate broker, for the home seller, if you deny that mortgage? How much money gets made? Zero. Zero. How much money gets made if you say yes? A lot. A lot. And see, the thing of it is, as we talk about these things, what you realize is lenders traditionally wouldn't do that because they were taking a long-term risk, right? That that borrower wouldn't do what? That wouldn't pay, and it would default, and they would lose money. Well, what if I told you the lender doesn't have that risk anymore? They don't. Because you know why? They're not going to keep that loan. They're going to sell it. You know who they're going to sell it back to? You. When you invest in the stock market. How many of you are invested in the stock market? 
How many of you have IRAs and 401ks and mutual funds? Well, guess what those are all invested in? Mortgages. So Bank of America doesn't have the risk in that mortgage anymore because guess what they did? They sold it back to the same people they just loaned the money to. Ain't that ugly. Welcome to finance. That's how it works. The ugly truth. That's how it works. That's not a political statement. That's just how it works. So what you need to know how to do is how to make money off of it while it's good and how to run away when it's bad. <laughs> that's the magic of it, right? Because that's what the bankers do. They learn how to make money when it's good and run away when it's bad. And guess what? They come back when it's good again. So you watch them. When they're buying mortgages, you buy mortgages. When they start selling, sell, run, hide. Go ahead, Bill. Housing crisis, and say if we were to have another, yeah. it's a lot worse in, um, in title theory. A lot worse in title theory states. What, okay, keep talking. I'm not. I'm not sure where you're going. I mean, worse. You'd see the. You'd see the effects more, or. You know what I mean? Like, I, I know what you, I, I mean, I, I hear what you're saying. I'm trying to think why you're drawing that conclusion. That's what I'm trying to think about. Why the, why it would be worse on a title theory well, state than a lien theory state. What I mean is because of the foreclosure process. Right. right. It would, yeah, exactly. You think I what mean, now? it's faster. It's faster? I actually think that makes it better in a title theory state because title theory states can work through the fallout faster. The foreclosures are going to happen at the same pace because the lending is the same, right? The only thing that's different is the actual foreclosure process. You're still gonna have the same number of foreclosures in a lien theory state and a title theory state. The difference is in a lien theory state, you're gonna see them wash through much more quickly than you will in a title theory. I mean, in a title theory state, you're gonna see them wash through much more quickly than in a lien theory state. They just take longer. So I don't know that it's any better or worse than any one. It happens faster in a title theory state, but that might not necessarily be a bad thing either. So in um, in a lean theory state, are they gonna um, the bank is gonna try to recover more because the court costs are gonna be a much lot more. more in a lean theory state. The court costs are gonna be greater because of the cost of the foreclosure process. So what you end up with is a lot more losses taken by the lender based on the cost of the sale in a lean theory versus title theory state. And I know we've gotten off subject here, but getting off subject in this stuff is actually a good thing because it gets you to thinking about the underlying things that we're talking about. So, the kind of thing you might have to know on a test, what's the lender's number one protection against loss in a mortgage? What would be the lender's number one protection? Don't lend on so much money. Qualify the borrower and don't lend so much money. Lend a lower percentage of the value of the collateral that you're taking in the first place. Does that make sense? But the problem with that, at least in the marketplace, is when you lend lower percentages, who do you start knocking out? Buyers. Buyers. Because the buyers who don't have that money to put down get eliminated, right? And I don't have a bias against buyers who don't have money to put down, but I'm saying if you really want to make loans that don't have risk, you've got to make buyers bring money to the table. Because the only thing that protects that lender ultimately, ultimately, is the collateral. And if you're lending 100% of the value of the collateral, aren't we going to have costs of the sale? Yes. Well, if you've already started at 100%, guess what you're destined to take? A loss. Because you start adding to 100%, there's no way you can sell the property. Because what are we going to lose right away as, as part of this process? Eventually, if we place it for list, if we list it with a broker, you're going to lose 6% right away, right? Well, now you're at 106% if you owned 100%. Then you figure the cost of the actual foreclosure sale. That's another 3, 4, 5%. All of a sudden, this lender's taking a 15% loss, even if they can sell it for exactly what they loaned out in the first place. So when you lend somebody 100% of the value of the property, you're banking on two things not happening. Number one, they're not going to default. Or, number two, that the value of the property is going to do what? 
go up. Corn to go up. What do you think in the previous mortgage meltdown the lenders banked on in making all those loans? The appreciation. That the value of the collateral was going to continue to do what? Go up. To go up. So that if you had to foreclose, it didn't matter because the property was always going to be worth enough to cover whatever you had longed out. So what ultimately happened? The value of the property stopped doing what? Going up. And it went down. And then the lender started taking losses and bigger losses. And when the lender started taking losses on 100% mortgages, what did they stop making? 100% loans. Does that eliminate buyers from the market? Yes. If you've got a problem with prices that are already falling and the lenders respond by, well, we're not going to make loans, what happens to prices even more? They drop even lower because you've taken buyers out of the market. And when, you take, when the prices drop even lower, what happens to people who even are current on their mortgages, but now they look at, well, I owe 420 but it's worth 280 <laughs> What do they stop doing? They, they stop paying. And does that, what does that do to pricing even further? See, they think you've got to have a PhD in astrophysics to understand a mortgage meltdown. We just explained it in 15 minutes. What's the protection against the mortgage meltdown? Don't lend so much money. We don't, well, we didn't learn that lesson. So, when you ask, is there going to be another one? What's the answer? Absolutely. Go ahead, Andy and I. <coughs> That's what you, you know how you were saying that um, you qualify 80%, right? Mm -hmm. But on that 20% that's left, I guess people start getting second mortgage, right? That's, okay. So that would be like the 80% of the primary mortgage. And so a first mortgage. Yeah. And, and then I still don't have the cash to put down, so may I go get a, a second mortgage. So who's taking a much bigger risk? The second mortgage holder is taking a much larger risk, right? because they get paid in that order. So if there has to be a foreclosure, the first mortgage holder is not really taking that much of a risk because they feel like they can sell it for at least 80% of its current value, but the second lender is taking a big risk. I don't know why the buyers do that to themselves. Because they want the house. Because they want the house and they don't have the cash. You will see this over and over and over. And by the way, it's not necessarily a bad thing. I've seen plenty of borrowers who didn't have cash to put down who paid their mortgages faithfully. The problem is sometimes it's not within their control. Notice what I said there. I didn't say it was about borrowers who stopped making their payment. I said once the value of the property stopped going up, the lenders got nervous and they stopped doing what? Making 100% loan-to-value loans. And what that did was took buyers out of the picture. And when it took buyers out of the picture, what did that do to the value of the properties? It pushed it down. So even the borrowers who were faithfully making their payment all of a sudden saw the value of their house do what? Drop. So it's not always about the borrower. It's not just about them. It's about the overall market. All right. Same question. Okay. Right. Well, you can still move to Michigan and buy a nice size house that used to be worth two fifty for like thirteen. You might, absolutely. That's exactly right, because of the marketplace there, right? And so this is going to be localized to some extent. But I'll tell you this, it's great to watch our market explode. Are you more ripe for a correction when values have gone up tremendously? Mm -hmm. Paid $187,000 for my house in 2009. If I sold it tomorrow, it would probably sell for $300,000. That's wonderful. Is that more ripe for correction, too, though, at some point? Mm -hmm. Absolutely. Absolutely. See, we've always been that market. See, we never had those California numbers where things went up 30% in value in two years. Until now. What markets were the hardest hit when we had the last mortgage meltdown? The ones that had those big appreciation numbers. I'm just telling you, you have to weigh the good with the bad. The bigger run-up you have in pricing, the more of a correction inevitably is around the corner. It's just the way it works. A correction, a collapse. A correction means going back to. Right? And see, here's the thing. People view real estate in such a funny way. If prices drop 10% right now, would people view that as just an absolute calamity if they own their house? Oh, yeah. yeah, would they ignore the fact that it went up 30% in the three years before that? Oh, no. Of course they would. 
Oh my God, my house is dropping in value. Yeah, but it's still worth fifty thousand dollars more. But the problem is, there's going to be somebody who bought it that high number, and for them, it's an actual loss. Does that make sense for everybody? See, if my house dropped to two fifty tomorrow, yeah, I'd be upset about it. But I would still look at it as well. I paid one eighty seven for it eight years ago, so it's still good for me. It's not good for somebody who just bought across the street and paid the three hundred for it. And that's that's the the, the thing about a, more, a market. When you involve mortgages. All right, so with foreclosure, we have to talk about this idea of redemption. Borrowers have the right to redeem their mortgage. Borrowers have the right to redeem their mortgage. And in North Carolina, that right extends through the foreclosure process. So as long as the borrower can show up with the money that they owe, they can redeem the property, no matter what the bid is at that point in time. Even if the bid is higher, they don't have to match the bid. Does that make sense? They can come up with what they owe and redeem the property. And the bid is not final until 10 days after the high bid was set. So once you get a high bid, it sits there. And for 10 days, anybody can come in and do what? Make another higher bid. They can upset the bid. And guess what resets? The 10 days starts over. A foreclosure sale is not final until the bid has gone unupset for 10 consecutive days. Does that make sense for everybody? And no matter how many times that process gets reset, the borrower always has the right to come in and do what? Redeem the property. They can pay what they owe and get the property back. The total amount. The cost of the sale, the whole nine yards, the total amount. So it's going to have penalties and interest and all that sort of thing. The thing of it is, the borrower doesn't have to meet the high bid, but what if the high bid is less than what the borrower owes? Can they redeem it for less? No. 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 They pay what they owe, period. They can't buy it at the foreclosure auction. They're ineligible to buy it at the foreclosure auction. The only way that borrower is getting that property back is if they pay what they owe. That's the right of redemption. I'm sorry? It's like people bidding on their houses at a high value different dates, not have to be like auction. You know, no, like it's not an auction. It's called an auction, but it's not what you're thinking of envisioning somebody standing on the courthouse going, Wong, give me Wong, give me that. It's not like that. You walk into the you walk into the register of deeds office and there's a book and every property has a page and you place a bid. Now you also pay a certain percentage of that bid in cash with your bid. In Wake County, that's 10%. So you pay it back? If you don't win the bid, yes, you get it back. Oh. So, for example, in Wake County, if you're bidding $100,000, you have to have a cashier's check for $10,000 to place that bid. How do you know it's bidding? Like, how do you know it's for sale, right? You have to go to the county courthouse. Oh. You go to the courthouse and you ask them what properties they have for foreclosure. They'll hand you the book look through and you place a bid with a cashier's check. And in Wake County, you have to upset the bid by $500. That's the minimum upset amount. Would the other person that placed the bid that you're upsetting, would they be notified? That they are notified when they're outbid. Yes. Once you're a registered bidder for that property, you're notified when there's a new upset. To them. And so you could come in and bring additional funds and, and re-upset the bid. Because remember, they still have your money too. Okay. Right? When you place a hundred thousand dollar bid, you brought them a ten thousand dollar check. Somebody comes in and bids a hundred and ten thousand, well they still have your ten. So if you want to bid a hundred and twenty, you just need to bring another two hundred bucks. You've got to bring ten percent of the amount you paid over. So you bring another check. Okay. Another ten percent, right? Yes. Who determines how much you have to pay to redeem the property? If it's just back payments and then the cost, or if it's the, the whole amount? Okay. So, so it would be the trustee okay. in conjunction with the lender. Because the a lender will tell the trustee, this is what they owe us. And the trustee will add their fees on top of it, and that becomes the redemption amount. Right, but like in the book, it, it talks about accelerated loan payment full. Mm -hmm. So who determines that? Is that just in the mortgage terms? That's in the mortgage okay. terms. The lender would determine that. Yeah. So when you talk about a foreclosure redemption amount, it's going to be the trustee. You would contact the trustee, and the trustee would say, this is the amount that's required to redeem the property. And you would not cut that check to the lender. You would cut it to the county courthouse, because at that point, all payments are going to go to the county courthouse. They're going to disperse all the funds. 
So basically you're talking about somebody getting a scratch off lottery ticket or something like that. You know, it never happens. Nobody ever redeems these things. They have the right to, and you need to know it for the test, but it never happens. I mean, you're talking about somebody who couldn't make their monthly mortgage payment. Now they're gonna come up with the whole thing plus all the fees, plus you know, what are the odds of that? Yes. Is there a maximum period or could this just go on indefinitely? It could go on indefinitely. Which is why they have minimum upset amount. So you can't upset the bid by a dollar. Right. You know, type thing. That's why they have minimum upset amount. Because it could conceivably go on for a while. Okay. But who bids those properties? You wouldn't even see it. You go in and you can go in there today and look at it if you want to. No. Would the owner allow them to go in? Oh, oh no, no, no! You're not going to have inter entrance to the property. Absolutely not. No way. It's like a house on saint, right? It's that is correct. That is correct. Which is why who's the most common buyer going to be at these sales? The lender themselves because they're probably the only ones that are going to be willing to commit that kind of money to it. Because for them, it's not a risk. They're already owed the money. If I'm owed 200 and I bid 200, it's coming right back to me. So it's just a wash for the lender, which is why they're the most likely bidder on these things. Unless it's a very low loan amount and somebody may go in and outbid. But no, you're not going to be able to view the property. All right, we good on this? Redemption period? Make sense? All right. Now, we need to talk about the idea of a deficiency judgment. A deficiency judgment is any balance that's not covered by the foreclosure sale. So once they have had the foreclosure sale, and assuming the lender buys it back, once they've also turned around and sold the property. This can happen many months down the road. So let's say Bank of America buys it at the courthouse auction for $215,000 and then they hire a real estate broker and they sell the property and they only net $185,000 after they sell it with a real estate broker. They can come back and sue you, the original borrower, for that $30,000 difference and they will get a judgment against you called a deficiency judgment because the thing you pledged as collateral was not enough to cover the total debt. Does that make sense for everybody? Okay. So they will end up with what's called a deficiency judgment in the amount of the loss that the lender took. If you do seller financing, so seller financing is a situation where the seller becomes the lender. The borrower is making payments to the seller. Okay. That's not an installment land contract. Don't confuse. In an installment land contract, is the buyer making payments to the seller? Yeah. Yes. But the big catch there is who still has title? Seller. The seller. Okay. In seller financing, the buyer is making payments to the seller, but who has title? The buyer. Title is transferred. Okay. In seller financing, you're not allowed to get a deficiency judgment. The reason is, in seller financing, what did the seller start with? They entered the transaction with the property, right? What are they ending up with? The property. So the law says you're whole. Okay? You're not allowed to do a deficiency judgment if you do seller financing. And that's a lien theory. I'm sorry? That's a lien theory, right? No, it has nothing to do with lien theory or title theory. Deficiency judgments work the same in both states. No, I'm not saying that. I'm saying the one of seller financing. What about seller financing? It's a lien theory because no. you transfer the title to the buyer. No, it doesn't matter. Seller financing is going to be title theory in North Carolina. It's going to be lien theory in a lien theory state. It's going to be title theory in a title theory state. Then the seller has to find a lawyer. To be the trustee. Yeah. That's exactly right. Oh. That's exactly right. Okay. Mm -hmm. All right. She, she, but she tried to draw the conclusion. Well, I'm, I'm telling you why I said it. Right. She tried to draw the conclusion that seller financing had to be lien theory. That's not. That's not the case. Okay? It doesn't have anything to do with it. If you're in North Carolina, any mortgage loan, whether it's seller financing or bank financing, is going to be title theory. And so what she said was, so the seller's got to find an attorney. And I said yes to be the trustee because in a title theory state, you need a trustee. So. Seller financing. You own the house, right? You're selling me the house. You good with that so far? So whose house is it? No. 
Selling. You're selling me the house. Whose house is it? Yes, after closing, whose house is it? It's my house, right? I borrowed the money from you. I didn't borrow it from a bank. I borrowed it from you. So now I have a mortgage loan with you, correct? I sign a promissory note with you. There's also going to be a trustee because we are in what kind of state? A title theory state. And that trustee is going to have the right to do what with my property if I don't pay you back? So foreclose. Sell it and pay you the funds from that, right? Does that make sense? Yes. Um, ways to avoid foreclosure. The next two slides are all about avoiding foreclosure. Alternatives to foreclosure. These are things we would do rather than foreclosure. Something called a deed in lieu of foreclosure. In lieu of means in place of. What's a deed do? Transfers title, right? Transfers ownership. So a deed in lieu of foreclosure is I'm transferring title to you instead of you foreclosing. Who would I be transferring title to? The lender. The lender, the lender has threatened to foreclose. And I've said, listen, you don't have to do all that. I'll sign the property over to you today. You can have it. It avoids the foreclosure process because I am simply transferring title over to the lender. It sounds like the kind of thing that lenders would be all aboard for. They're not in most cases. And the reason they're not is they want a deficiency judgment. They want to make sure that if they take a loss, they have a judgment against you for that loss. Because at some point in your life, it's very likely you'll pay that judgment. Because at some point in your life, you're probably going to want to do what again? Buy a house. And the next lender's not going to make you a loan until you do what? Pay that judgment. So they want the deficiency judgment. And guess what you're not entitled to if you do a deed in lieu of foreclosure? No deficiency judgment. So the bank, by accepting title, is giving up the right to the efficiency judgment. So they are very unlikely. But now, if you go back to the fact that deficiency judgments aren't allowed in seller financing, so would a deed in lieu of foreclosure be a very good option in a seller finance situation? Yeah, because you can't get the deficiency judgment anyway. Does that make sense? You kind of connecting the dots there? So if you do seller financing on something, you know you can't get a deficiency judgment. The best thing that could happen there is just the buyer just signs title back over to the seller. That would be the best outcome. A deed in lieu of foreclosure. Okay. Everybody good on what a deed in lieu of is? Another way to avoid foreclosure is something called a short sale. A short sale is another way to avoid foreclosure. It's on page 403 in your book. But people, I think, get confused about these, primarily because they want to make the word short have something to do with timing. It doesn't. Short sales are anything but short from a timing perspective. In fact, these are probably the slowest, most torturous transactions you will ever participate in. What is short? If it's not the time, what do you think is short? The money is short. The money is short. Specifically, here's what's happening. You have a borrower who's in default. There can't be a short sale if the borrower's not in default. Because I'm going to tell you, so here's what you're asking the lender to do. You're saying, my house is not worth what I owe. Okay, is everybody with me? My house is not worth what I owe. So please, I want you to let me sell it for less than what I owe, and you'll let me off the hook. That's, that's what you're asking the lender to do. Is everybody with me on that? Mm -hmm. Why do you think it's going to be a requirement that you already be in default or behind on your payments? Put yourself in the shoes of the lender. Breon, I owe you $200,000 and my house is only worth one hundred and eighty. Can I sell it and only give you the one hundred and eighty? Is that okay? Breon's going to look at my account. If I'm current, what's she going to say? No. No, why? Because you're current. Yeah. Keep paying. You're doing a good job. You just keep right on doing it, right? Lenders do not take losses to be nice. Why would a lender say yes to a short sale? You owe me 200 but I'll take the 180 if that's all you can sell it for. When their only alternative is what? 
foreclosure, which is going to get them an even worse result. Because if they have to go to foreclosure, think about the order that things get paid in. Who's going to get paid first? Uh, the attorney trustee. That's going to take some of that 180 away, isn't it? Yeah. And if I foreclose, if Breon forecloses on me, what kind of condition am I going to leave that property in, most likely? Bad. So are you going to be able to sell it for 180 or is it going to get worse from there? Yeah, worse from there. So not only now she can only sell it for 150 plus she's got to pay the trustee, plus they have to wait for this process to play out. So she's going to get like 130 a year from now. What sounds better, 130 a year from now or 180 today? 180 today. That is a short sale. That is the case you're making to the lender. And the only way you can make that case to the lender is if they got no other option. They are staring foreclosure down the barrel of the gun. And you're saying to them, well, short sale sucks. Foreclosure sucks worse. That is the case for short. Does that make sense for everybody? So what, what are, what's going on? Talk, talk me through it. What would be the things you would look for to recognize this is a good candidate for a short sale? They're behind. Borrower's behind. What else? Property's not worth what? The loan balance, right? The loan balance is higher than the property value. So those are the two factors that you're always looking for in a short sale. Number one, borrower's behind. Number two, property is underwater. The loan balance is more than the value of the property. Those are going to be the two defining characteristics of even thinking about a short sale. Who would do the short sale? Yeah. Um, how do you mean? You mean it's the owner? Mm -hmm. It's the owner of the property because I'm still the owner. It's my house. They would hire a real estate broker to represent them. Who has to pay that commission? Who's taking a loss? The bank. So who's paying the commission? The bank. Because it's just going to be a further reduction in the amount of money going to them, right? When they look at a short sale, they have to weigh all that out. So if they look at it and they say, well, the property's worth 180. So when you bring them a short sale offer, what you're going to bring them is a statement of how much money they're actually going to see. Because they're not going to see 180, are they? No. They're going to see 180 minus the attorney's fees. So say the attorney's charging 1000 bucks. Okay? Now they're at 179. Say you got a 6% commission on this thing. So now they're, say, maybe at 169. So you're saying... We can give you 169 today. They're going to compare that with what they think they can get if they move forward with what? Foreclosure. So when you say who's paying it, ultimately the who's paying is the bank because it's just coming out of their loss. They are agreeing to take a loss now versus a bigger loss later. Do they sue for a deficiency judgment? What do you think? Do they sue for a deficiency judgment? Absolutely they do. But, is this not doing the bank a favor too? Mm -hmm. Yeah, because what's their alternative? To lose, to lose more money later. So if you were smart as a borrower, wouldn't you make, well, I'll do this short sale and I'll make the house real pretty and get you the most possible money as long as you don't come after me for... A deficiency judgment. Couldn't you make that part of the negotiation if you were a smart borrower? Because remember, your credit's still going to get ruined. Your credit's still ruined here. Because you're not, what was the first rule of being qualified for a short sale? I'm not making a mortgage payment. Combined, I'm not making a mortgage payment with them reporting to the credit bureau that you didn't satisfy that loan. That's not pretty, right? So the, the, borrower's, the, the borrower's credit is still getting ruined here. The one sweetener in the deal for the borrower is you won't come after me for a deficiency judgment. But if you don't know to ask, is the bank still going to do it? But yes, sir. They'll be like, oh, yes, yes. Oh, thank you so much. We're glad you came to us with this. And two days after you close, you get a notice from the court that you just had a deficiency judgment filed against you by Bank of America for that $28,000 loss. So as a borrower, that you better maybe hire a real estate broker who knows a little something about short sales who would... Um, talk to the lender and say, now, we're not going to have any deficiency judgments, correct? It would seem like it would be better to do a short sale or be in even a title, be a title in the state than it would be in North Carolina. 
in a what well, we are title theory. I'm so sorry, I'm lean theory stuff. Lean theory. Sorry. Why is that? Because the process uh, for the lean theory could drag out for years, and you'd be smart to just go ahead and let them do a short. So sale. you're saying they have more motivation to potentially do a short sale? It would seem that way. That would seem that way to me too. I think that. Does everybody agree with that conclusion? Yeah, yeah. That the more painful the foreclosure process is, the more attractive the short sale process is. Because remember, short sale first and foremost is designed to avoid what? Foreclosure. I mean, a short sale, the only way you can make a case to a lender that we should do a short sale is if you can show them that foreclosure would be worse. So, foreclosure is worse for the lender in a lien theory state than it is a title theory state, so it would stand to reason that they'd be more inclined to do short sales in a lien theory state than a title theory state. I think that's a pretty good conclusion. Why do you say short sales so long? Why do they take so long? Yeah. Because you're dealing with big banks. you got to get to the right person who has the ability. See, it's not like you and your money. If they were asking you to take a loss, who would they call? You, right? Yeah. I'm calling Bank of America. Bank of America doesn't own that note anymore. Remember what I told you they were going to do with it? Sell it to who? To, to Chase, and then Chase has sold it on the open market to Fannie Mae, and Fannie Mae has sold stock to 40 million people. So how many people have we got to get to sign off on this short sale? A lot of people in that chain, because everybody who has ownership of that note has to say yes. And Bank of America no longer has ownership of that note. They may be collecting the payments, but they don't have ownership of the note. So Bank of America has got to, and by the way, if Bank of America is servicing the note and it's not their law, so they're in a real hurry to get in touch with everybody. Yeah, no. no, that's why it takes so long. What, what's the note? The note, the promissory note, is the underlying debt. And that debt has been sold and sold and sold and sold. So you sold it to Annie, and Annie sold it to Oliver, and Oliver sold it to Nick, and Nick sold it to a group of five investors up here at the front of the room. So when I call you and I say, hey, can I do a short sale? You're like, well, yeah, let me get back to you on that. And you have to contact Annie. And you say, Annie, this borrower wants to do a short sale. And what does Annie say? Oh, I don't, I don't own it anymore. anymore. I sold it to Oliver. So now you got to contact <laughs> Oliver. You say, this borrower wants to do a short sale. What do you feel about that? And Oliver's like, I haven't had that note in months. I sold it to Nick. And so now you got to get Nick's phone number. And you call Nick. And Nick's like, well, I sold it to a group of investors. And now you got to contact who? Oh, All the group of investors. Is that going to take a while? And yeah. meanwhile, you have no desire to do any of this because you're not owed the money. But you're the only point of contact that the borrower has because you're servicing the note. So the borrower is not made aware when their loan is being sold. Oh, they're made aware. You're made aware. They're made aware, but their only point of contact is going to remain Bank of America. And the reason for that is that Bank of America is going to continue to collect the monthly payment. And you know why they're continuing to collect the monthly payment? Because they can charge whoever does own the note a service fee for collecting that monthly payment. They'll send you a letter saying your, your note's been sold to so and so, but you'll continue to make your payments to us as a convenience to you. And so we can charge you. Gotcha. But, but then the Bank of America doesn't even own that property. They don't own the note, they don't own the property, they don't own anything. All they're doing is collecting the payment and passing it along and charging a fee off of it. So if it's foreclosed, it wouldn't be Bank of America? No, it would be whoever these investors are over here that bought that note. And they probably bought it tangled up with another thousand notes. Now we got to figure that out too. Yeah. <laughs> You see why a short sale takes so long? Yeah. Because ultimately, there's probably not one person who can make a decision. And if there is, you, it takes six months to find that one person. It might take them five minutes to make a decision go, oh, yeah, I'll do that. But it took you six months to figure out who the one person was. You see how it gets ugly? I'm telling you, this stuff gets very interwoven ugly. This is why when you look at a lender like State Employees Credit Union, people are like, I don't know how they do short sales and foreclosures so fast. I do, because they don't sell their mortgages. They keep their mortgages in-house. So if you owe them money and you fall in default, you know how many phone calls they got to make? One. Hey, asshole, you owe us money. <laughs> and if you don't pay us by next week, we're going to foreclose. And if you want to talk to somebody about a short sale, guess who you call back? The same person who just called you an asshole, right? And you say, well, hey, I can't pay you. Can we do a short sale? And that person is the decision maker. 
because they keep it in house. They haven't sold it 57,000 times. And I'm not saying that's better or worse. I'm just saying that's the difference between keeping it in house versus selling it on the secondary mortgage market. Does that make sense to you guys? Yeah. Go ahead, man. It's probably out of the scope of this class, but what is the incentive to sell the mortgage like that? What is the incentive to sell the mortgage? It's not out of the scope. It's actually what we're going to talk about in the next chapter. That's the secondary mortgage market. Here's the incentive. Bank of America only has so much money to lend. So Bank of America likes lending money. And they don't like lending money for the reason you think they do. We think they like lending money because they're going to get paid interest, right? The problem for them is interest is slow. The day they made that loan, they made a pot full of money. Because they charge origination fees. They charge all kinds of fees. So how many of you have ever gotten a mortgage? That, that, that bucket called closing costs. And you look and you're like, where did all that come from? Have you ever looked at that thing and you're like, what is this origination fee? And what's this funding fee? And what's an application fee? And what's this loan commitment fee? Guess where all that money's going? The to the lender, Bank of America. And it's profit on day one because you paid all those fees at closing. With me? Yeah. So, now, if Sandy is Bank of America, and she's loaned me that $100,000 and she made $3,000 in fees on day one, well, it's great, she made $3,000. The problem is, she can't make another loan. But she doesn't have what? The $100,000 is now gone. But if she can sell that $100,000 note to Jen, because Jen's okay with the long and slow payback, because Jen's only buying this mortgage note because this is her retirement fund. She's buying it as part of her IRA fund, or her Roth, or her um, you know, her 401k is invested in mortgages. Does that make sense for everybody? Those are the kinds of things that want these long, slow returns. What has Sandy now got back in her pocket? $100,000. The $100,000. She made $3,000 in fees, and now she's got the $100,000 back so she can do what? Okay. That's it. Make another loan and make $3,000 more tomorrow on the same one. So in two days, she's made $6,000 in fees on that same what? $100,000. $100,000. And what's she going to do again? She's going to sell that one to Faith. And then she's going to make another $3,000 in fees on that one. So what's the incentive to Bank of America? Because they can make fees after fees after fees after fees after fees. And by the way, they don't have any more of the risk. Because where'd the risk go? The person to whoever bought the note. Does it sound like a good business to be in? Yeah, it does. How many of you want to go be bankers now? <laughs> That's how it works. That's how it works. So the incentive to them is to make loan after loan. After Why do you think they contact you and say, we want to refinance you? Because every time they refinance, it's a new loan with a new set of fees. And then they're just going to sell that loan with somebody else and move it on down the line. That's the incentive. Okay? Right there, I hope you understand the next chapter. So it's a good question. All right, do we understand short sales? Everybody good on that? All right, let's take a break. I'm sure you are ruminating thoroughly in your brains already.